Well, good afternoon. I have the unenviable task of following um, that very moving presentation. Um, it's a testament uh, to the important work that's going on today. Um, my name is Verna Williams, and I am the Interim Dean at the University of Cincinnati College of Law. I'm so happy to be here today. I thank all the organizers of this conference, and thank you to our hosts here at Case Western Reserve University. I'm here, I'm, I'm pleased to be here um, at the start of this very important summit, and I commend you all for coming out to work on improving our criminal justice system. As you've heard from Ricky Jackson, nothing could be more important. My job today is to introduce your opening speaker for this afternoon, the Chief Justice of the Ohio Supreme Court, Maureen O'Connor. Chief Justice Maureen O'Connor is the 10th Chief Justice and the first woman to lead Ohio's judicial branch. Since assuming the state's highest judicial office, Chief Justice O'Connor has led significant reforms in the Ohio legal system, including improved access to justice. This commitment includes addressing the impact of court fines, fees, and bail practices on economically disadvantaged communities. She has focused on these issues as co-chair of the National Task Force on Fees, Fines, and Bail Practices, and as past president of the National Conference of Chief Justices. She also is immediate past chair of the National Center for State Courts Board of Directors. Two years ago, Chief Justice O'Connor led the formation of the Regional Judicial Opioid Initiative, connecting eight member states across multiple governmental, research, academic, and law enforcement disciplines to fight the nation's drug crisis. The progress made by this first of its kind effort has spawned a national organization organization launched recently to deal with this terrible epidemic. Chief Justice O'Connor joined the Ohio Supreme Court in 2003 and was re-elected in 2008. Elected Chief Justice in 2010, she was re-elected to a second six-year term in 2016. Born in the nation's capital, so she and I are homegirls, and raised in the Cleveland area, Chief Justice O'Connor's law and public service career spans more than three decades and includes service as a private lawyer, magistrate, common pleas court judge, and prosecutor. She also served as Lieutenant Governor, a post that included directing the Ohio Department of Public Safety, and following the 9-11 attacks, chairing Ohio's Security Task Force. Chief Justice O'Connor earned her Bachelor of Arts degree at Seton Hill College in 1973, and her Juris Doctorate from Cleveland Marshall College of Law in 1980. And now, Chief Justice Maureen O'Connor. Thank you, Dean. Thanks for those uh, remarks. Thank you for the introduction. Um, and thanks also to your university, the University of Cincinnati School of Law and the Ohio Innocence Project. I want to thank uh, the host from Case Law School, Dean Scharf, and also Dean Berg, who couldn't be here with us today, uh, to Prosecutor O'Malley, the Ohio Transformation Fund, the George Gunn Foundation, Jim and Nancy Petro, and the Cy Prey Awards given recently to uh, Ohio Innocence Project through Dworkin and Bernstein. I'd also like to recognize someone very special to me, and that's Pierce Reed, who served me well for 12 years, uh, 12 years plus, as a judicial attorney in my chambers. Pierce's insights were invaluable to me in research and drafting of opinions, and the Ohio Innocence Project will benefit greatly from his involvement. I always say my loss is the Innocent Project's gain. Uh, this is the first ever of its kind in Ohio, and I certainly hope that it's the first of many uh, here and around the country. The Ohio Innocence Project has freed 27 exonerees in the 15 years, and I commend all the hard work that went into each effort. That is a mighty victory, absolutely. But that statistic is also evidence of a system that isn't delivering equal justice and fairness. Honest discussions about convictions and the roles of law enforcement, prosecutors, defense counsel, and the judiciary have never been more necessary than they are today. We need honest dialogue about this issue. 
on a continuous basis, vetting the claims of the convicted, bringing forth the wrongful cases, talking and working and sharing ideas and ways to improve. This is how we plant the seeds of progress. The purpose of an address by an opening speaker is to set the stage for the conference as it unfolds. But considering the goals of this conference, to educate, to share ideas, and to promote positive change, I think that Ricky Jackson set the stage a few minutes ago. Mr. Jackson, your story is one of incredible and absolute fortitude and of hope. It's inspiring for the way you persevered through the wrongs inflicted by our justice system. Your courage to turn down a deal to shorten your sentence in return for admitting to a falsehood is absolutely remarkable. It becomes even more significant when you think about how other Americans would react when faced with such a choice. Your journey is one of valor, forgiveness, and deserving of the utmost respect, and you certainly have mine. Most of all, your story deserves to be told and retold. Over these next two days, all of you will talk about advancing legal processes and related themes of human nature, science, government resources, and political obstacles. That is the core of this mission. But the battle to prevent and correct wrongful convictions is driven by a stark and tragic reminder of the human element. The stories like yours, Mr. Jackson, these stories ensure that the public and those in power recognize the need for real progress in itself, real, and that all of us have to work for it. Anyone in power who fails to listen or try to learn from these stories is turning his or her back on truth and progress. We hold out our justice system as the greatest in the world, and it is the greatest. But analyzing its greatness must lead to the study of our shortcomings when we measure the ideals of the foundations of the justice system against the realities of the day-to-day -day administration of justice. Our founders took stock in the British legal system. It represented an advancement in any way, in many ways, in its day. But the administration of British law, as we know, was quite often abused to the detriment of various groups and populations. Our founders built a stronger, better, overhauled system atop the British model. It represented a great advancement. It can be, but it has also been abused. The core principles of fairness and equality contained in those foundations can be ignored, but they cannot be erased. The foundations of our system of law are the foundations for us to act upon. I have been involved in many endeavors in the past several years that have proved to me that progress can be made against seemingly intractable problems. One is the project that involves other human stories about injustice and how we best address the impact of courts, fines, fees, and bail on the poor and the disadvantaged. As was mentioned, I co-chair the National Task Force on Fines, Fees, and Bail Practices. By working with state courts across state lines, we have been able to develop policies and principles that are solid reference points for state and local courts to take a cold, hard look at their own systems. Then the work of our task force can be used to help them change their processes, set up pilot programs, use new bench cards to help educate and remind judges of proper bail determinations, and work with local governments and legislatures to appropriately fund the courts, rather than make them the ATMs that must wrestle costs and fees from the poor who cannot afford them. Although the public is often focused on the cases heard in federal courts, state and local courts, where most of you do the majority of your work, represents the center of our legal system. Perhaps I don't have to tell this group, but I use this statistic all the time, and it really impacts lay people who do not work in the legal system. Six, or excuse me, 96% of the caseloads in this country are in state courts. 4%, only 4% are in the federal courts, and of those, more than half are bankruptcy related. So progress in state and local courts is real progress for our institutions and for our laws. 
Changes are happening and they benefit all of us because all of us, whether judges or prosecutors, defense attorneys or members of the community, have an interest in ensuring that our courts are fair and just. And those who deserve to be convicted are. And those who do not deserve to be convicted are not. Just as our work in bail reform has been guided by constitutional commands, including Bearden versus Georgia, you have constitutional guideposts. Brady versus Maryland is the North Star for us. Brady stands for the notion of fairness and recognize that justice requires fairness. I have been a defense attorney and a prosecutor, a magistrate, a common police court judge, and for the last 15 years, an appellate judge. Never in any of these roles did I see the role of fairness, the presence of fairness, the acts of fairness, faith and adherence to fairness as detrimental to the true goals of justice. Fairness and justice are not lofty aspirational ideas. They are the principles that must guide every prosecutor as well as every criminal defense attorney. The ultimate interest of both should be the same. Vigorous but fair prosecution and defense of the accused. And those interests lead to a goal that we all share, to achieve justice. Prosecuting and imprisoning the innocent destroys the fundamental dignity of a human being. We know that all too well from people like Mr. Jackson and the other Ohioans that had been freed from wrongful convictions. And while they suffer, so too do the mothers and the fathers, the sisters, the brothers, and all too often the children. We have a criminal justice system so that those who cause harm to society can be punished, rehabilitated, and deterred from future criminal acts. Unfortunately, there are many people amongst us who must be removed from society because they inflict violence, cause suffering, and wreak havoc in communities. We need and rely on our prosecuting attorneys to ensure that those who commit crime, criminal wrongs, are stopped. And I know firsthand how difficult the work of the prosecutor is, the pain and the suffering that they witness every single day. But we must recognize that none of the goals of our criminal justice system are met when an innocent person is imprisoned. And equally important, we must recognize that when an innocent person goes to prison for a crime that she or he did not commit, the person who did commit the crime remains free and often continues to inflict harm on others. When this occurs, no one, including the original victim of crime, sees justice. We must remember that the original victim of the crime is victimized again when a wrongful conviction occurs and the wrongfully convicted person becomes another victim and also deserves to see justice done. And all of us, whether judge or juror or police officer, prosecutor or defense attorney, become victims because the public's trust in us and our work fades and diminishes. During the course of this conference, you're going to learn more about wrongful conviction and its causes. You likely already know that although some wrongful convictions are driven by intentional misconduct and gross incompetence, the vast majority of wrongful convictions occur because of a simple fact. We are human and we make mistakes. And when we have tried our best not to do so, and even when we have tried our best not to do so, and equally important, you will learn from one another about the ways that prosecutors, defense counsel, and communities can serve to work together collaboratively to prevent wrongful convictions. Conviction integrity units are one mechanism to do so. I want to commend the many prosecutors who will serve as panelists here who have expertise in, in these units, including Russell Tai, who now serves, as was mentioned, the chief of the only CIU uh, currently operating in any of Ohio's 88 counties. Although Cuyahoga County is the first, it has already shown the faithfulness to the prosecuting attorney's promise of a thorough, thoughtful review of innocence claims. 
Earlier this year, the Cuyahoga County CIU and OIP worked together to see justice done in the two cases that have already been mentioned, Mr. Saylor and Mr. Miller. Each organization had a shared goal, to get to the truth and to get justice. They reached that goal after long investigations and reinvestigations and hours and hours of hard work that I have no doubt caused much stress on counsel and client alike. But the results reached were worth it for Mr. Saylor and Mr. Smith, for their families, and for all of us. I realize that many prosecutors feel that these units are looking over their shoulders and making a difficult job much more so. But I applaud the prosecutors who have embraced the concept and are working to do what is right on a case-by-case -case basis. These units are invaluable to the process of evaluating the evidence presented at trial, as well as new information that may not have been available at the time. Debates about evolving scientific standards that might cast doubt on the science used at trial are difficult ones for appellate courts, but CIUs can thoroughly and fairly vet those claims. CIUs are not the only tool available to communities, but they are an important one. You will hear many examples today and tomorrow that I hope will cause you to think and to remember that every step towards justice is an important step and why all of us, prosecutors, defense attorneys, and judges, serve the public good. I commend you for taking the time to learn and to take that next step towards justice. The likeness of William Howard Taft graces the main hall of our Supreme Court building here in Ohio. Taft, the only person to serve as President and Chief Justice of the United States, said this more than a century ago, and I quote, the administration of the criminal law in all states of the union, there may be one or two exceptions, is a disgrace to our civilization. Five decades later, Justice Felix Frankfurter cited this quote in a dissent and wrote that while the situation has improved, there remain serious defects in the criminal justice system. Much time has passed since Taft and Frankfurter uttered those words, but they have been anchored by the United States Supreme Court in cases like Brady and Bearden. Defects remain today, and it's easy to focus only on those problems. But we must also recognize that progress is being made. Your attendance here is but one example of the progress around the country. In places as different as California and Pennsylvania and Illinois and North Carolina, in New York and Texas and right here in Cleveland. Your dedication to fairness and to justice and the knowledge you gain here are invaluable. Take them home with you to your courts and communities and continue the good fight to fight the fight to protect the people and to promote the fair and just and strong democracy, which we all love. Thank you and God bless.